Welcome to New Life Living, brought to you by New Life Church in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. We hope this Bible study led by Pastor Alan Brooks encourages you in living the new life Jesus is offering you. Good morning again. If you happen to be visiting today, I just want to tell you up front that we're kind of in a transition zone as a church. We've just finished a series called Beyond Death's Door. And uh, today we're going to talk about something that we as the church need to have a conversation about every so often. Now, quite frankly, as I told the 9 o'clock service, it's a very one-sided conversation. I'm going to do all the talking, you're going to do all the listening, okay? But the reality is that we need to think about these things more often. And today we're going to think about them together. What is it that we are called as the church to be? Because too often times when we even think about inviting somebody to church... We often think we're inviting them to a building, but it's really not to be a part of the building, is it, that we would like them to come to church? We want them to be a part of the family, a part of the community. And even more importantly, those who are part of the family recognize, as the video said, that this is simply a home to a greater calling that God has for us beyond these doors. And so that's the focus of where we're going today. Part of this in my mind got started because uh, recently I've seen a neighbor of mine who's a young professional. He's an engineer, very busy in his job. Uh, got two small children, but each time that I've taken stuff to the recycling center, I've seen him there volunteering his time and, and helping you know, at the recycle center. I've had some more conversation with him about it, and he tells me that in addition to that, he actually helps at a food pantry, I think, a couple of times a month as well. And it got me thinking, what is it that motivates people to give of themselves to a charity, to a cause like that? Now, it's different for different people. Sometimes people volunteer their time uh, to gain an advantage. You know, high schoolers, oftentimes, that's what they'll do in their final year of high school is they're trying to load up their college resume, right, and show all the places that they served and volunteered their time to look good to their college. Some of us, raise your hands if you've done it for community service, uh, because, uh, no, you don't have, you don't, you don't need to acknowledge that, but... Some of us have had volunteer work forced upon us. Uh, Some of you think when we ask you to serve in our kids' ministry or in some of the programs over at the church, we're forcing you to do it as well. But there's also this other group of people, which we hope are within the body and within the walls of the church, who do it because they believe in the cause. They're really genuinely trying to help people and do something that would either help people or help the environment. I had made a call uh, last fall because we thought we had a grand idea, and the idea was that we wanted to try to bless some families outside of the walls of our church by making dinner for them here at our church for Thanksgiving. Some of you maybe even remember us talking about that. And I made a call to a, a, a food pantry locally because we thought maybe they might have the names of some families that we might be able to reach out to. And when I told the person that what we wanted to do is we wanted to bless some families. They were instantly enthusiastic, like, wow, that's awesome. I know so many people that need that help. And I said, well, here's what we're planning to do. We're, we're going to send an invitation out to them or call them, however we do it, and then we're going to bring them to the church and we're going to you know, make dinner for them and just, just love on them. And they're like, wait, wait, wait you're, you're going to make them come to your church? And I said, uh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah you know, we, we just want to love on them and make dinner for them at our church. Oh, well, we don't mix charity with church. Now, I have to tell you, I was struck by that. I, I've, I've heard there was a separation between church and state, but I, I wasn't that familiar at that time that there was a difference and a separation that needed to be maintained between charity and church. But as I've reflected over that over the last few months, I've come to realize that that person knows something about her world and how it's different from our world. Because there is a difference between ministry and charity. And it's very, very important for us to recognize that we in the church are not called necessarily to charity as much as we are called to ministry. I'm indebted to a Warren Wearsby in a book I would highly recommend to read if you haven't already called On Being a Servant. And he defines ministry in his book as this. Ministry is when divine resources meet human needs through loving channels to the glory of God. 
Now, there's some similarities there. I would say a lot of the people who help at a charity are doing it because they love and care about people. I think that's real for people outside of the church. I think you also see that what they want to try to do is to meet or help meet a human need, similar to what ministries are seeking to do as well. But don't miss the difference. What a ministry does, fundamentally is we seek to bring divine resources to these human problems. Can I tell you one of the reasons that's really important? Last week, I finished my 18th year of so-called full-time ministry. In 1996, I actually... Praise the Lord, thank you. But in 1996, the Lord called me to go full-time into ministry for a large church in the area. And then about six and a half years ago, we started this church. But... As I look back on this, I can tell you that when I first started into ministry, it was overwhelming. Now, part of the reason for me it was overwhelming is I'm I'm the kind of guy who, you know, I I cry when I watch Lassie. Now, you can say, oh, well, that's so sweet, and he's in touch with his feminine side and that sort of thing, okay? There's some oohs and ahs. But the genuine truth is I care. I mean, I can see a person's situation, have an appreciation of that without even being in the situation myself. I'm what they would call highly empathetic. And that empathy causes trouble for me. Because when I first went into ministry, i got to tell you, I was overwhelmed. I was like, oh my gosh, the, the needs are so much bigger than I can help with. That's true for all of us. A fundamental truth that you need to recognize is man's needs far outweigh man's resources to meet those needs. And we have to, have to, have to have divine resources if we're ever going to hope to be successful in meeting those human needs. But there's another fundamental difference between ministry and charity. And hopefully you caught it in the definition. And what is it? It's the motive for why we do it. Exactly. We're doing it for the glory of God. We're not doing it to gain an advantage. We're not doing it because the pastor forced us to and he demanded we volunteer our time. It was none of those kinds of things. It was because we wanted to do it for the glory of God. And that's what we're going to talk about today. If you haven't done so already, I'd ask you to turn to uh, Philippians. We're actually in the second chapter there today. For those of you that may not know this, Philippians is one of the letters that the very famous Apostle Paul wrote to a church there in this area called Philippi. Chapter 2, verse 1. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy... Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus." who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, So that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And in every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. One of the first parts of that definition that I wanted to zero in on this morning is those divine resources. What are they? What are our divine resources? 
Well, the very first resource that you need to make sure you have if you want to help meet the need that mankind has out there is you have to be in Christ. And what that speaks to is a word called relationship. We've got to recognize that doing ministry starts with being in a relationship with Jesus. You can't give something that you don't have. If you're not in that relationship, you can't talk to somebody else effectively about having a relationship. If you don't have his divine power and promises, you can't give his divine power and promises to anybody else. Now recognize this, just because somebody does good things, even if they do it in Jesus' name, as some do, that doesn't mean they're in a relationship with him. Matthew deals with this in our chapter 7, verse 22, where he writes, and it's Jesus speaking, He says, on judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name, we cast out demons in your name, and perform many miracles in your name, but listen to what Jesus will say, I never knew you. In other words, these people who have done good things, even in the Lord's name, will stand before Jesus on judgment day, and he says, I don't know you, we had no relationship." So ironically, they were doing good things, maybe even for good reasons, but it starts with us being in the relationship. Don't miss that. I find a lot of people in the church get hung up on the things they're doing for God. God isn't the most concerned about the things you're doing for him. He's most concerned about your relationship with him, and it starts with being in that relationship. If you are in that relationship, Paul in verse 1 talks the participation in the Spirit. The word there in the original Greek is the word koinia that some of you might be familiar with, which means fellowship or close association, a brotherhood, a band of brothers is kind of the idea in modern terms to this koinia. But he's talking about this participation, this fellowship in the Spirit. Now catch this, if the Holy Spirit's not in you, then you're not in Christ. Some people have that confused. But Scripture's clear about it. Romans 8 verse 9 says, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But what it tells us that if we're in relationship with Jesus, then we are in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in us. And if the Holy Spirit is in us, then that gives us access to supernatural gifting. 1 Corinthians 12, another of Paul's writings, he says there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. There's a lot of different spiritual gifts, and I'm going to name just a few of them. But one of the things you're going to notice as we start to talk about them, some of you go, oh, well, I know people who aren't Christians who have that ability, or people who have that gift. But when we're talking about spiritual gifts... We're talking about a supernatural enabling that that person is given by God, which allows them to do something they would ordinarily not be able to do. For example, if I were to sing beautifully right now, you would know that that was a supernatural gift of the Holy Spirit, okay? And as much as I prayed and asked for that particular gift, it just hadn't happened, okay? And that's the other thing that you're going to find is that some people in the body have some spiritual gifts, while others in the body have other ones. Doesn't necessarily mean some are better than others because it's God who decides who gets gets those gifts. He's the source of them all. But God, through the Holy Spirit, gives us supernatural gifts of administration, of giving, of service, of leadership, of mercy. Can you imagine that those would be helpful as we did ministry, having those kind of gifts? Absolutely. There's also other sign gifts. There's gifts of prophecy, the gift of tongues, the the gift of discernment of tongues. There's also gifts where we have supernatural wisdom, supernatural ability to discern how things are going. These are all things that if you're in Christ, that you're enabled to do because of the Holy Spirit. Not all of us, again, are able to do all things But we're able to do those things supernaturally when the Holy Spirit has given them to us. 2 Peter 1, our verse 3 says, By His divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. Do you believe that? 
We have received all of this by coming to do what? Know him. The one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. Now catch that, because I think that's important. Because we have his power, because we have his promises. And are you happy about that, by the way? You know what? Great promises we have. If God be for us, then what? Who can stand against us, okay? To know that when I die, I have a promise of a life beyond death's door. We could sit here and name all kinds of promises. The only reason you and I have those is because we're in Christ. But as his point here is, Because we have them, now we're able to share them. You cannot share something that you don't have. You cannot give a divine resource of God's promises and of his power if you don't have it. They could get it and you might not have it. But the point of the matter is you have to be in Christ and in that relationship to take advantage of it. And for those of us who are not in Christ, catch this, we're not doing ministry. We're doing charity. Because we're not doing it for the same or the right reason. And unfortunately, I think what happens a lot of times is we're seeking to solve these massive human problems out there. And we're trying to do it with human resources. Which ain't going to get the job done. We're going to fall short every time. We're going to win some of the skirmishes and maybe one of the battles. But guess what? We're going to lose the war. Because the human needs are much more massive than what human resources can fix. We need the divine power. We need God's promises. We need the Holy Spirit working through us and in us if we're to expect any of this to happen. Amen? Wiersbe also talks about these loving channels. And a question I would ask you to ask yourself is, how am I called to be his loving channel? I think Paul speaks to at least a couple of ways that that could be answered in our passage today. One of the verses here, he says, being of the same mind, having the same love, being in a full accord. Now, that's not a Honda, by the way, but being of one mind. Now, if you were to simplify those phrases down into one single word, most of you would come up with the word unity. I don't know if you think about this very often, but the church is the ultimate team activity. We're called to be in unity. We're called the body of Christ. We're not multiple bodies, we're a body. There are different parts of the body in different places, but there's one body of Christ who's one big team. In business, we used to have an acronym for team, that was T-E-A-M, together one, together, everyone, what? Does anybody know it? Achieves more. Now, if that's true out in the business world, could that also maybe be true in the church, do you think? Do you think we're going to be more effective as lone rangers just going out and doing our own thing? Or what if we pooled our resources, our manpower, the amount of money that we can help provide to an organization? I find that For many people, Christianity is like putting a puzzle together when you don't have all the pieces. You ever tried to do that before? Super frustrating, isn't it? You know, to find out the person before you lost some of them, and especially if there were corners, right? (laughs) But that's why a lot of people are failing. A lot of churches, quite frankly, are failing because what they're trying to do is they're trying to do it all independently rather than to do it corporately. Paul also gives another thing that I think is an important part of being a loving channel, where he says to not be selfish, not try to impress others, to be humble, to think of others as better than yourself. And I'm sure this is true for you as it is for me, but that just comes naturally, doesn't it? And even that I would say that would show that it doesn't come naturally. Those are not things that we naturally do. Do you know what the number one enemy of unity is? Whether it's in your home, whether it's in the workplace, or whether it's in the church, the number one enemy of unity, pride. 
And part of what Paul's saying here is we need not only unity, but we need humility. I played football in high school and uh, played on you know, a lot of different teams, some that were more successful than others. But one of the things that I found out in team sports, it's not the teams with the most talented athletes that are the most successful. It's the teams that learn how to be humble and unify around each other together. Because when that quarterback or whoever it is starts thinking, I'm hot stuff, and if it wasn't for me, there wouldn't even be a team, well, that spreads to the other guys who are blocking and tackling and trying to catch the balls he's throwing. And they're not going to give it their effort because he thinks he's so wonderful. And it cuts both ways, doesn't it? The truth is, in order to do God's work successfully, we have to have to have humility. In verse 14, Paul writes, do all things without grumbling or complaining. If you don't know this already, make a note about this. Grumbling and complaining is a sign of pride. And it's working that pride against unity. You're trying to say that you know more, you can do more, whatever it is, and that's part of the reason that you're complaining about it. It's beneath you. I don't know if you've ever thought about this relative to Jesus, but I think Paul gives a great illustration in this passage where he talks about what Jesus was willing to do. What if it had not gone down that way? What if God the Father came to Jesus and said, hey, I got this great idea. You know, sin's a real problem. It's killing all of our people. How about this? How about I send you in a human body to grow up on the earth and then you die on a cross and get separated from me in death? What if Jesus' response would have been, ha, I don't think so, that's not my job. Hey, I'm God here too, you know, right? Isn't it fortunate that that's not the way Jesus responded? That Jesus says, Father, I'm the man. I'll go do it. I'll become a man. I'll become a servant to the point of death on a cross. Which for those of you that don't know this in the first century culture, that was the most humiliating way that somebody could die. He literally put himself at the bottom rung of the ladder in society by being willing to die for a cross. Why? Because he saw the need that you and I have as being more important than his need to be acknowledged as God. Hallelujah. Didn't take away from him being God. If anything, it made him even more precious and more wonderful as a God that he was willing to do that for you and I. And that's part of what Paul's trying to say in this passage. Don't you see what he's done? How he's been willing to humble himself and become a servant? The Apostle John In his epistle, 1 John, our chapter 3, verse 16, writes, We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. Notice what it says next. We ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Dear children, let's not merely say we love each other. Let us show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth. And so we'll be confident when we stand before God. We talked about that in that last series, that even as Christians, we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And we're going to answer for the things that we've done in this life. Would you not rather to stand there in confidence knowing that you had looked beyond yourself and saw others in need and were willing to do something about it, to give of your time, of your talents, and of your treasure? Or do you want to stand there like the cowardly lion in the Wizard of the Oz? You know, just shaking like a leaf. Now, we might do that anyway, because he's God after all, right? But I would much rather stand there and be able to say, my beloved, my son, my daughter, Hopefully he won't say daughter to me. But daughter, if it's you as as a woman, well done, good and faithful servant. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because everybody says they want to hear that. Christians, anyway. 
It's a whole other thing that our actions would line up with our words so that when we stand before God, that's what we'll be able to hear. And that's John's point. That's Paul's point in what we're looking at today. Talk's cheap. We've all heard that before. But actions speak. Human needs. Paul in the passage says that each of you look not only to his own interests, but to the interests of others. The message translation (laughs) tightens this up and puts it this way. Forget yourself long enough to lend a helping hand. I mean, that kind of nails it, doesn't it? Do you know part of the problem for me, and maybe for some of you, is I'm so busy meeting my own needs, pursuing my own desires, that I don't really have that time left over where I'm thinking about what other people's needs are. I'm so caught up in my own situation. It's out of sight, out of mind. And then the other thing that it often leads to is what I call situational reactions. We see the person on the street corner, and whether they've got a sign or you can just tell, you think, oh, wow, the person needs money. And so what we'll do is we'll dip dip into our wallet, roll the window down, and give them a 10 or a 20 or whatever the case might be. But really, and here's the question I want you to consider, how much difference did we make in that person's life? Was it ministry? I would suggest not. Charity, maybe, but it certainly wasn't ministry. In most cases, what we're seeking to do is to make ourselves feel better, to try to put away some of the guilt we have for not spending the time, not putting the energy out to go really, truly help these people. Let's talk about a solution. First of all, I believe it starts with you realizing that man's needs are massive and overwhelming. If you look at all the physical needs that are out there for food, clothing, shelter, water, all those things, the needs are massive and they're great. And might I suggest they're going to get worse. They're not going to get better. As this world starts to unravel further, that's going to get a lot worse. The emotional needs are already there. Those are going to increase as well. The need that people have to feel loved, to feel cared for, to have somebody share compassion with them. Those needs emotionally are great. But we have to realize that to truly help people in need, We need to move away from situational reactions and move to what I believe is intentional response. Now, let me tell you what I mean by intentional response. The first part of intentional response is this. We recognize when we do ministry, the number one need above all the other needs that that person has is what? It's to know Jesus. If you miss that part you are going to miss the boat. That is foundationally number one. You may not always get to it right up front. You might have to help that person in some charitable act before you really have an opportunity to do ministry with them. But the truth is you've got to recognize that ultimately that's how you're going to best help that person. Wearsby in his book says, perhaps that's the major difference between Christian ministry and mere humanitarian benevolence, as helpful as it may be. Both can be done in love. Both can put food on the table and shoes on the feet. But only true Christian ministry can put grace in the heart so that lives are changed and problems are really solved. The best thing we can do for people is not to solve their problems for them, but so relate them to God's grace that they will be enabled to solve their problems and not repeat them. This was true for you, this was true for me, but when people come to a relationship in Jesus, things change. The way we think changes, the way we act hopefully ultimately changes, and it leads us to an understanding that I now have divine resources. Those divine resources we were talking about earlier, those aren't just for us. God wants Everybody to have them. He wants us, as amazing as this sounds, he wants us to share those resources with them. And when we give them access to the things of God, we now have divine resources to work on our problems with. Now, just like it is with us, God doesn't always solve our problem, does he? As much as we pray about it, as much as we try to work towards it, but one thing God always does, 
He walks with us through it. He's there. And it changes our perspective. We know, hey, if God be for me, who can be against me? Somehow this is going to work out. Because God says that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And if I have that divine resource of relationship, I can claim that promise. If I don't have that relationship, I cannot claim that promise. Can't can't tell you how many different times I've heard Christians quoting to non-Christians Romans 8.28. You got to deal with the relationship before you can claim the promise. So, the divine plan. Here for New Life Church, I can tell you that even since we've started this church six and a half years ago, I would say almost on a consistent weekly basis or every other week basis, I have charities or ministries that approach me about us getting behind what they're doing. And you know what? Most of them are good, some are great. Some are amazing what they're doing. But unfortunately, what happens is it becomes kind of like the elephant in the room. I mean, everybody can see the elephant, but we're somewhat overwhelmed by it because the elephant is so big. Y'all heard the cliche, how to eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Well, recognize this. We as the church can't do everything. If we tried, we would be totally unsuccessful at it. But though even we can't do everything, we can do something. And I believe that God is calling every one of us who are in Christ to do something. And he's calling us as the body of Christ to do it together. Because we'll be more effective together. Could you and I take a sack of groceries and go to the storehouse and say, hey, here's some groceries? Absolutely we could. But when we do it together and we take a truckload rather than a grocery bag, do you think maybe that kind of makes a statement of some kind? People start to go, wow, what's happening? Where'd this come from? When we send a check, as we did last month, to, of nearly $1,800 to that food pantry, do you think that that caused them to go, wow, I wonder who these guys are? Now, if you and I individually send them a $50 check or $100, I'm sure they would appreciate it, but it's not quite the same when it's all pooled together. And here's part of the point, guys. When we look at charities outside of ministries as we work within the community, we recognize that if we invest correctly in a charity, it's going to cause them to look at what we're doing and it may lead to ministry. Are you with me? Because inevitably, you know what these people go, well, wow, why'd you do that? (laughs) Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you why we gave that. Because Jesus loves me and we know he loves you and the people that you're serving. And he wanted us to bless you so that you could be a blessing to others. You think that plants a seed? Maybe it waters one. And someday, whether it's that day or another day, it's going to bring an increase. And so we as a church, since we started, we've consistently given back out to the community. Now, we started where I believe most of us should start in our giving by tithing. What we collect as a church as a whole, we took 10% and we went right back out into the community with it. We bumped that recently to 15. I've been trying to encourage our board to even go up to 20. Because I believe that if we invest out there with divine resources, God's just going to give us more to share. You know, the reason we don't have resources sometimes is because we hoard them to ourselves. And God's like, well, if you're going to keep them for you, then why should I give you more of them? But it's when we're willing to share and we give it away that God says, hey, I got some more stuff for you. And then he gives us more that we can share with. And it's a spiritual principle that we should all be living by. It's a principle by which this church lives by. That's why we've never missed a month. When we were saving for this building, all the other things that we've done in the history of this church, we've always been faithful to give God his first fruits and send him right back out the door. Because we knew that God would bless us if we did that. We've wanted to really do a lot more focus outside of our doors for some time. We recognize the church still goes on. We still have to pay for this building. We still have light bills and other things. We have ministries that need help here. You know, children's ministry, our uh, cleaning crew, all those ministries would still love to have you. But what we want you to do is start thinking beyond just in here and what's going on out there. When I called that food pantry at Thanksgiving, one of the things the woman said is she said, aren't there some people in your church you could help? 
And part of what I told her is we're trying to break that image of the church. The image of the church in so many people's minds is a group of people that just simply take care of their own rather than going outside of their doors and doing something. That hasn't always been true. In fact, the reputation of the church used to always be that it did so much for the community. I would love this community of Rio Rancho Albuquerque to miss us if something ever happened. Wow, I sure miss that New Life Church. Whatever happened to those guys? Man, they were so faithful and blessing us with their time and their talents and their treasure. So how do we eat this element? The way we eat this elephant, I believe, is by doing it together, working in unity and working with humility. For lack of a better name, we came up with the name Community Action Team. And part of what we're doing right now is we've been contacting some of the ministries that we've already been working with. We're actually contacting more beyond that. But I had somebody initially make contact face-to-face with them. And I've got to tell you a little bit about that story because I've been praying for a while that God would bring somebody along who says, hey, I'm your guy, I'm your gal, I'll, I'll take and head this up and, and get a team going and really just charge on this community, community action idea. I can tell you, I had somebody in mind, I talked with somebody about it, and God on a particular day was speaking to me as I was driving, it was 6.15 in the morning, it was, I was held heading to our weekly elders meeting on Wednesday morning, and I I heard this name for the first time, I thought, well, I hadn't thought about that, forgot about it, and as I'm driving later in the day, a couple of hours later, I'm thinking, oh, I ought to call this person. So I call her on the phone, and when I call her, she says, oh, wow, I was going to call you, and I said, oh, well, let me tell you why I was calling. I really felt like God laid your name on my heart today as somebody we ought to talk to about heading this up. Here's the cool God part of that story. You started crying, as I remember. But Sam Apodakis, I was talking to her, she said, I was on my knees before God this morning, praying that God would reveal to me what my place in the church is supposed to be. And this is God answering that prayer right now. So what Sam's been doing is she's been meeting with these different groups and finding out, how do you need help? Now, she's told me that some of them, especially the charities, go Say, what? <laughs> I know you guys send us money, but you're, you're wanting to come help us too? <laughs> They're not used to people doing that. That was actually part of the reaction that I wanted them to have, okay? Because I knew that that would open more doors for us. But what they've given us is they've given us a list of what their real needs are. And so part of what we've done is we've set a project goal for the next two months. And that first project goal is that we want to donate 500 manpower hours, in the months of May and April. There's two groups we're going to do that with right now. One is Storehouse West, and the other is CareNet, who works with uh, couples that have gotten pregnant and aren't married and trying to deal with whether they're going to continue with that pregnancy or not. But there are great needs within both of those organizations for manpower hours. And we found out what that is. And there will be opportunities in our family room after service for you to sign up for that. Our goal, 500 manpower hours. Another part of that goal is we want to donate 1,000 pounds of food and clothing to that organization together with Storehouse West. Do you think that will make an impact when that arrives? I think it will. Now, some of you are thinking, wow, that's huge. I mean, you're going to do this with some other churches or something? No, we're going to do it right here. But let me break that down for you for a second. 500 manpower hours isn't a lot. If each one of the partners in our church just simply said, I'll give two to three hours of my time in the next two months, we would have 500 hours just like that. And we could help these organizations where they truly need help. If each one of our partners just simply said, hey, I can donate six or seven pounds worth of clothing or food. I mean, is that a doable goal? I mean, for most of us, six, seven pounds, I mean, that's that's a five pound bag of sugar and a couple of green beans or something, right? (laughs) Now, by the way, we do have these on this board over here, which is going to be moved into the family room, but we have selected items that we're going to ask you to bring because we know what they need. And that can of black-eyed peas you've had for the last 10 years, they probably don't need that, okay? We don't want you unloading all the stuff nobody in your family wants to eat, okay? (laughs) Unless you find something on that list, okay? But here's the point. We want, and by the way, 9 o'clock, correct me if I'm wrong, they pretty much cleared that board, right? 
And so we reloaded that board. See, they think they're better than the 11 o'clock service. I don't know if I shared that before. But I'll have to report back to them about how many we had left, so we'll make sure we find that out. But seriously, we do want you, after the service is over, to go into the family room. Sam will be in there with a couple of other people. You can grab one of those to take. If you want to double it up, you can do that. But here's the plan with the food and the clothing. We want to collect that in the next two weeks. And on Palm Sunday, which is two Sundays from today, we're going to have all that stuff collected. And the first part of that next week, Sam and a team are going to go deliver that to the storehouse and to CareNet and bless them with it. Uh, the manpower hours, some will start in the month of April. Some will actually start in the month of May. One of the big things for the storehouse is they have a big annual food drive that they do with the post office. And once all that food comes in, you know, the post office just opens up the door like the mail and they just throw it out on the ground, basically. No, no, I'm just kidding. But I had to do that because we have a retired postman in the, in the room. But, but the reality is they need help sorting and stacking and putting all that food away. And that'll happen in May. And so is this something we can do as a church, do you think? I think it is. I think it's doable. And this is just the beginning. We're hoping by this fall we'll have a whole series of these kind of things set up. We're literally on a monthly basis. Uh, we're going to go with an idea that I've had others share with me called Second Saturday, where we'll have a particular project and different groups or different people can come help on that day, and we'll just go do something out in the community. And I believe if we do it for the right reason and in the right ways, we're hoping to do this together, that we will be able to meet the motive. Because the motive is still the same, is it not, in doing this? It's for the glory of God. If you want to do it for the glory of God, I just encourage you to get on board with this. If you're not, that's okay. Nobody's going to even know. But if you want to do this together with the rest of the church team at New Life, I think we can magnify who God is in our community, and people will go, wow, I want to know who Jesus is. Some of those who don't yet know him. Amen? Amen. Would you stand so we could close in prayer? Father, you know the heart that uh, myself and some of the other leaders have had in this, and, and Lord, you know that you've been pushing on me and us for quite some time, and Lord, finally we're here, and um, we've arrived, and we're, we're ready to do what I know you've called us to do, Lord, and we want to do it for the right reason, Father. I, I want to do it. I'm hoping my brothers and sisters want to do it because we appreciate what you've done for us. We want to do it for your glory. And Father, may it have great impact in our community as, as these initial couple that we work with, these couple of charities and ministries are blessed by it. May that spread to so many others. But Lord, help us to have wisdom about who you've called us to help. As I've said here, Lord, we can't do it all, but Lord, we are going to do something and we're going to do it for your glory. And all of God's people who are in agreement echoed that with amen. Amen. Thanks for listening in. If you have any questions about New Life Living, you can call us at area code 505-898-9788 or email us at info at nlnm.org. Until next time, our prayer and hope is you will experience the fullness of the new life Jesus has to offer you.